If you were to visit our house on a typical Sunday afternoon, you'd find everyone sitting around the kitchen table. We're likely to be covered in all sorts of tiny pieces and a whole bunch of rules sitting beside us. When we get stuck in a trap of what do we do in this particular scenario, we'll see us flicking through the rules just to understand how the creators intended the game to be played. We refer to the rules because they're important. They define the structure of the game, so we understand how it's to be played. But they also provide balance, so the game's as fair and equitable as it can be to all players. But as we've found, sometimes the rules don't cover every scenario that's before us. And sometimes the rules appear to work in conflict with each other. And at times like that, we've had to come to the conclusion that the spirit of the game in which the rules are written should override the precise reading of the rules. But if you play in games groups often enough, you'll encounter what to some people are the worst of all players, the rules lawyer. The rules lawyers are notorious enough that games have been devised to have rules to stop them, or worse, monsters that mock them. One of our favourites um, is Munchkin, which is a monster game. And we have a rule in there that you play a curse against somebody when they have to consult the rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, or worse, when you play and you essentially flip the board, this is all rubbish, I hate the rules, I'm gonna end the game. <laughs> so you see, you know, they're there. <laughs> These players argue with the rest of the group about the letter of the law of the rules, usually to gain an advantage in the game, but always to hold everyone in that perfect check, even if it destroys the whole purpose of the game, which was to sit down and have fun. In our gospel reading today, we encounter real life examples of rules lawyers. The Pharisees and the scribes are two groups of Jews who are not priests, but considered experts in Jewish law and how to interpret them. When God had given Moses the 10 commandments and other Jewish laws in the Torah, which we call Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, he was defining exactly what living a righteous life looks like what it's necessary to live in the community with other people in a fair and equitable way. In other words, the rules to play this game of life. Over time, these laws had created questions for the Jews, such as what does work actually look like when it says not to work on the Sabbath? So the Pharisees and scribes had created additional laws, which sort of flesh out the rules for these scenarios. And these interpretations and extra rules were not universal. Different groups interpreted the letter of the law in different ways and thus created different additional rules to support these. So kind of like everyone's got a different house rule and you're trying to work out which house you're playing in. Interpretation of God's rules and laws still go on today with Bible studies, sermons, and hundreds of authors. And so what's so wrong with being a rules lawyer anyway? If these additional rules and interpretations ensure everyone's clear and keeps God's laws, isn't that a great thing? Rules lawyers are not all bad. It's really useful to have someone who keeps the game on track and ensures you're playing the game you started, or at least you thought you were playing, as opposed to some other sort of corrupted derivation. The problem comes when they use rules selectively to suit their own purpose, perhaps pointing out rules that only affect others and ignoring it when it would hinder them. Or maybe they've misinterpreted the rules altogether and are insisting you follow something that's not actually in the rules. You see, the problem is with the attitude, the motivation, or the misinterpretation, not exactly the lawyer. And we see that in the strong words of woe that Jesus proclaims on the Pharisees and scribes. Woe to those who whitewash tombs, 
Jesus says the outward observation of the law is not enough. God's laws are not just about our outward behaviour, our outward appearance. The last commandment cuts across all of this. Do not covet. The last commandment reminds us that jealousy, our own inward thoughts, our inward monologue, our inward actions, is at the root of most sin. Woe to those who keep people from learning about God. In the synagogue where Jesus stood that day, physical barriers had been erected to separate Jews from Gentiles, Jewish women from Jewish men. These barriers stopped all people from being able to hear all words of God and learning how to worship. Woe to those who misinterpret the law or actively misapply it, following some minor law and missing the entire meaning of the law. Jesus calls out the practice of holding people to account for smaller things like tithing, but missing the main point of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. So what does this mean for us today in Marutna? We're not all leaders in the church. We're not all experts in the law but we are all representations of Christ to the world as part of his kingdom. So what we say and do matters just as much as what the Pharisees and the scribes did. So we need to know our Bible, all of it. Even those weird little books in the middle that people kind of try and skip over because they're hard to read and understand. Joining Bible studies, or like Simon suggested last week, read other books and authors to have a better understanding of just what it is our faith is. Because just like games, manuals, the Bible does not contain a rule for every scenario we're going to find ourselves in life. And sometimes we're going to find ourselves in scenarios where the rules seem to misalign. What the Bible does contain is everything necessary for salvation. So when we quote God's law, we need to examine our own motivation behind it. Even today, we see places that the cross, our symbol of hope, and God's great exodus for the both Jews and Gentiles from the slavery of sin and death, has become weaponized to perpetrate violence, instill fear, and continue to divide people. So when we speak of God's laws, how are we interpreting them? Is it with the understanding that each law stems from God's heart of justice, mercy, and faithfulness to all people? Or are we wielding it as a weapon for people, waiting for God to smite that person that really annoys us? Or waiting to see them get their comeuppance on the day of judgment? Or are we selectively placing laws to put importance on, to keep those people out who don't quite belong here? And when we look for our leaders today in our churches, politics and place of work, do their actions match their words? If they proclaim they are driven by the law of God, is their focus on the letter of the little tiny laws or the principles that Christ himself proclaims are the most important? Justice, mercy and faithfulness. Is it all for show to gain your trust and vote or is it the real deal? Just like when Jesus confronts the Pharisees and scribes, where does the gospel of Jesus confront us or convict us of our own held beliefs? Let us continue to press into the uncomfortable parts so we can grow as the Spirit continues to reveal more to us about God's kingdom. Let us pray.